So I want to start off by just asking you guys some review questions. I know it's on pancreas, but I'm going to ask you some review questions on adrenal gland. If you want, you can go there, wherever you want to be, but I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions. The reason I'm doing them is because some of you are recording like the own things, uh, your own uh, recording devices, if you're doing that, that's good because I ask a bunch of questions and you can just always pause it to answer it yourself when you're going back home to review and see it. Uh, some of you probably know I'm trying to do that whole uh, recording things and putting stuff up on the YouTube stuff. I post it on Angel. Uh, if you want to get to it, my little cool screen name is Prof Roofs. So, yeah, that's funny. I didn't copy anything else. But P R O F R O O F S. And I put the lectures up there. You should see like a bunch of them. I'm going to try and make this into like a bigger, like free teaching AMP site. But, anyways, for right now, I have the lectures there. So I have lecture one, two, three, and four. The first three are blurry because the camera was messed up. But I figured it out by last time. So, I, I mean, I'm doing it now. And I found it was helpful in school when they recorded them. But you just always go back, you press pause after a question, see if you can answer it, and play and pause. If you have the time, it helps out. So anyways, I'm going to do a series of questions here on the adrenal gland. Uh, we'll start off first with where are the adrenal glands located? On top of the kidney. So how many do we have? We have two of them. The adrenal gland is divided into two portions. So there's the inner portion. What's that called? The medulla. And then the outer part. Good. The cortex has how many regions to it? Three. What's coming from the medulla? What hormones are coming from the medulla? Take your time. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the other name for them. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine. Before I go to the cortex here, adrenaline and noradrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine, they fall under which one of the three classes of hormones? I think I heard it. Yes, the amines, which are what derivatives? amino acid derivatives. There's two amines, there are two amino acid derivatives. I'll give you a second to find your chart here. If you find that chart where it categorizes it, it was the first chart that I gave you, page three of the packet, and it has the different categories. So there are your amines or your amino acid derivatives. There's two of them. What are the two amino acids? Good, and out of those two, which ones produce epi and nor epi? Tyrosine. Which one produces the majority of the amine hormones? Tyrosine. What's the only amine hormone that tryptophan produces? Melatonin. Going back to epi and norepi, are these water soluble or lipid soluble? Water soluble. So are they going to have extra or intracellular receptors? Extracellular, which means they're going to use what type of things inside the cell? Camp, which is a what? Yeah, it is a secondary messenger, along with one other thing uh, that's helping produce that secondary messenger it's on. It's a something protein, a G protein. So the G protein is involved in that stepwise process mm -hmm. of making cyclic AMP. There's more to the steps, like you saw in the video, but that's important to know. So, what's the general idea here? Anytime something is water soluble, is it going to be on the surface or inside the cell, that hormone? Surface. So it has a what type of receptor? Extracellular. So it's going to use the cyclic AMP, the CAMP, and all that. If it's lipid soluble, where's the hormone going to go? Inside the cell to a what type of receptor? Intracellular receptor. And staying in that group of amines, what's the only one that's lipid soluble? Thyroxine, which is coming out of where? The thyroid gland, and it's number T, what? T4. What's the other number? T3. So I probably asked you about 20 questions. Probably like 10 of them are going to be on the test. So you want to make sure you understand stuff like that. And that's why, again, I try to record them. So you go back, play, pause, answer it. Okay, go back, review it. But as well, what's probably more beneficial is to make a chart. And if you're confused with that, try making it. I'll show you. If you need help starting it, Again, I'll show you. We still have next week as well, too. So, uh, any questions? Oh, let me finish the cortex right here. Just a few questions on the cortex. Cortex has three regions. The tougher part is pronouncing it. Of course, in the test, you don't have to pronounce it, but we'll try here. The outermost region is the zona 1. That's pretty good. 
pretty good. Glomer yulosa. Glomer yulosa. The middle one, the next one in, this is the fasciculata, and the easier one inside, get articular. So this is G, F, R. Now, they have different hormones, and those hormones are going to regulate different things. Your choices here are regulating salt, regulating sugar, or regulating sex hormones. Which one is going to be the one, which layer, which zona, <coughs> regulates sugar, uh, sugar content in the body? The fasciculata, the middle layer. Which one re regulates uh, salt? Mellosa. So the sex hormone is going to be the inner one. The what? Get the reticularis. What do we name the group of sex hormones? What are those called? Androgens, such as <coughs> testosterone, estrogen. There's a few more, progesterone, and there's some derivatives of there as well, too. So uh, those, the sex hormones are the androgens. I'll give you a second because I don't expect you to memorize this. They fall under which one of the three classes of hormones? The steroids or the lipid soluble. So all lipid solubles are derived off of what main component? What main compound? Cholesterol. Good. So uh, that's just the androgens. What's the hormone that regulates sugar? What is that called? cortisol and the one that's regulating salt yeah. aldosterone what's the salt that it's regulating sodium what's the symbol for sodium and a positive uh, one more set of questions here they're called something corticoids aldosterone is called a what corticoid mineral corticoid a stereocorticoid is actually the androgens, which are going to be on the inside. I'm not going to use that one on the test, but that's what they are. And then what do we call a cortisol, a what corticoid? Glucocorticoid. Because aldosterone is a mineral corticoid, because what's the mineral it's regulating? Sodium. So, so you want to make sure you get these. If you're not, you know, there'll be time, hopefully today, at least five, ten minutes. You can sit down and help you with that. So now, is there any questions with adrenal gland? All right, so let's move on to the pancreas. The pancreas is going to be located deep or underneath what organ? Deep or underneath the stomach. The stomach, is that on your left or right side? It's on the left side. I gave everybody else a fun way to remember that. Uh, the liver is going to be on the right, the stomach is going to be on the left. I love the liver because it always helps me on the weekends and during the summer, every day of the week. And uh, so it's like my right-hand man. So it's on my right side. Or for girls, right-hand woman, whatever you want to call it. So whatever gender is fine. So anyways, liver is on the right side, stomach's on the left. I find that's confusing. Kind of too. So it's going to be underneath the stomach, over on the left-hand side. If you want a lab, if I didn't show you this week, I can show you next week. If you're in the practical or if not doing anything after it, we can lift up the stomach of the cat and you can see it. So, uh, Exocrine and endocrine. Exocrine we're going to talk about when we get the digestive system. Not today, but next class. Endocrine, the pancreas is an endocrine organ because it releases its chemicals through what? Bloodstream. I don't know if you guys remember. You don't have to know the percentage, but know which one's more. Exocrine or endocrine? Exocrine. It's exocrine, and again, we'll talk more about this in the digestive system. I don't know if you guys caught it last time. But it releases those chemicals through what? through ducts, the main pancreatic duct, or what's the other one? The accessory duct, and dumps it right into the first part of the small intestine. What part is that? DJL, right? Dewadne, D, what's J? Junum, Ilium. So it dumps it into the Dewadne. So 99% of the uh, pancreas is exocrine, but that 1% is very important. It has what hormones that are becoming out of the pancreas? There's a lot, but what are the main two? Glucagon and insulin. And they are coming out of these little circular regions in the pancreas. What are those circular regions called? Very good. The islets of Langer hands. And one more question. Alpha or beta? Which one secretes insulin? The beta cells. So the pancreatic islets are just when you take a tissue 
take the pancreas and you section it or take a biopsy and put it on a slide, you'll see these little circular regions. And let me just show you here, I'll come back to this. It's highlighted in the red dots. And this is very zoomed in. When you zoom out, you'll see a bunch of those regions. You can go Google, just write pancreatic islets, and you'll see a bunch of circular regions. I think I showed you guys as well last time. But in those islets, you don't know what each cell is unless you use a different type of stain form. Some cells are alpha, so they're going to release glucagon, which is different than glucose. Glucose is a sugar. Some are beta cells, so they're going to release insulin. Then we have delta cells. The delta cells are going to produce a somatostatin, which inhibits both of those, which I'm not really going to get into. There's more I can say about that. And uh, the F cells, not too much is known about that, so I really couldn't tell you anymore. But uh, it's called pancreatic polypeptide. So I might ask you extra credit about this. I'm not sure yet, I'm going to make it. But you definitely know alpha and beta cells, that's insulin, and that's going to be glucagon. So let's draw some stuff out here. If you remember back to, we're talking about skeletal system. We talked about a certain mineral going between the bone and the blood, through it going back and forth. This is calcium. So we talked about parathyroid hormone, we talked about calcitonin, which is not going to be on this test because we did it in skeletal system. But the same idea applies here. Either it's in the blood or it's not in the blood. Not in the blood, it's going to be in cells. So if you want to draw it out, it might be helpful to understanding this idea here. So we're going to have cells and we're going to have the bloodstream. The blood, I'm just going to represent this blood vessel. And cells. There are three main cell groups where sugar gets stored in. I forgot if I did it with you guys, if the class is a little bit different. Where, where is sugar going to be stored? What's that? Liver is one. I've got my right hand man here. What are, what are the cells of the liver called? I think I heard it. Something sites. Yeah, just there's an O that links it. Hepato. Yeah, good. Hepatocytes. So, hepatocytes. So the liver cells are the hepatocytes. Sugar can be stored inside there. There's two other types of tissue. Think about when you eat. There's, what does all that food become? Where's fat? What are these cells called? Adipose of the tissue. The cells would be adipo. Sites. The nucleus is what's on the periphery because it's, it's all fat on the inside there. So we have our adipocytes. And well, there's another very important area because sugar is going to go through glycolysis. It's going to make energy. What's energy? ATP. What are we going to really need energy to go into what type of tissue? Uh, muscle cells. So. I don't know if this will work here, but if you guys know that game, draw this. I'm trying to play it right now. What am I? Yeah, well, it's right usually be this way here. But yeah, just a lot of muscle fibers. So mainly skeletal and cardiac. I'm not going to be that specific, but muscle. So there's three types of tissue that the glucose is going to be stored inside of. So I'm just going to make this a big group on its own right here, cells. And blood is a group as well, too. Glucose, I don't know if you guys have caught this by now, but what type of shape do they draw? Like how many sides the glucose? That's six. It's a hexagon shape. So we'll draw glucose here. I missed the side. There we go. I guess I can't count. And there we go. So just a couple molecules of glucose. If there's one molecule of sugar, we call it a wet saccharide. Monosaccharide. So here we have some monosaccharides, say glucose, for example. So there is different ways to regulate this. There's two different hormones. We have insulin, and what's the other hormone coming from the pancreas? Glucagon. One hormone is going to cause glucose to go into the cells. We call this uptake. Uptake into the cells. Uptake into cells. The other hormone is going to cause glucose to go into here. So, a few things. When somebody goes to measure their glucose, go to a clinic or to a hospital, where is it being measured in? 
coming out of what vein they usually go for? Median cubit. So we go, it doesn't have to be that one, but we measure it in the blood. So when somebody has a high glucose level, I left the word out of it, they say high blood glucose level. That's what they're talking about. Because glucose doesn't just disappear and go somewhere. When glucose levels go low, it doesn't vanish. Where do they go? They go into the cells. So that's when it goes down. But I mean, again, it doesn't disappear when it's low. It's just being stored there inside the cells until it's needed. So this arrow here represents taking glucose from the blood and storing it into cells. So is this going to cause high or low blood glucose levels? Low. What hormone will do that? Insulin. That's why people will take insulin around meal time or like hours after a meal. What do you think? I want to see if somebody has the reasoning behind it. Let's uh, give it a shot. Somebody, if they don't produce insulin, would take insulin around the time of a meal, whether it's a little bit before or after, or like hours after a meal. Around the meal time. Because if you eat a meal, it's gonna break down. The carbs will break down to sugars, and then you don't wanna leave the sugars here, so the body will secrete it, or you would take it if you're a diabetic, type one, uh, and it would put it here into the cells, but thereby lowering it. What's the other hormone? Glucagon. Glucagon is going to take the sugar that's stored in here and do what to blood glucose levels? That's going to increase it. And so it's going to cause an increase in blood glucose levels. Insulin is going to cause a decrease in blood glucose levels. So when would glucagon be released from the body in terms of a meal? I didn't hear what you said. When you skip a meal. Usually about an hour after a meal. So when you don't eat for a while, glucagon is going to be secreted and it's going to release the storage of the sugar and put it into the bloodstream. There's also gluconeogenesis, which is making glucose out of proteins and out of lipids and things like that, but if you take nutrition, you'll get more into it. So uh, we'll go back here to cells. There's another thing to say about it. So here's glucose. We said these are what? Saccharides again. Mono. So when they go into these uh, tissue types or into these cells, they're going to be stored. So when they're inside each of these, I'm going to just draw it in a separate area here. I'll just try to draw a hexagon again. Right. They're going to link together. So when they're linked together like this in a chain, here's another word that starts with a G. Does anybody know what that is? You've probably heard this before. Gly glycogen. Glycolysis would be the breakdown of glucose. Anything is process. So uh, glycogen is going to be not a monosaccharide, but polysaccharide. So it's many sugars chained together. And then there's also like little branches that come off of that as well too. So if I was to ask you, so now you have three words that begin with G. You have the sugar. What's the sugar? Glucose. Glucose. You have the hormone. What is that? Glucagon. Glucagon. You just think about it. Um, I don't know, it's just not glue. It's going to mess you up. But never mind. So glucagon, uh, it's going to break it down. And then the storage, the polysaccharide is what? Glycogen. So if I was to ask you a question, I'm going to give you the answer here. Which hormone breaks down glycogen? Which hormone break, uh, maybe I'll make it a little longer of a sentence. Which hormone breaks down glycogen and releases glucose into the bloodstream? Glucagon. So glucagon is going to break these bonds here. It's going to break them. There's two different types of bonds. I forgot if they were alpha and beta bonds, something like that. But it's going to break the bonds and it's going to release the glucose into the bloodstream, thereby doing what to blood glucose levels? Increasing. Therefore, again, just one more time, would this be secreted uh, near meal time or after a meal? 
you know, like a while after a meal in order to increase those levels because our brain needs glucose, one of the big important ones, in order to function and to continue on. So this diagram here you'll see it in words when I go back to the PowerPoint slides, but one more thing to add on to them, and that's the cells out of the pancreas that each of these come from. Insulin is coming from which one? Yeah. Beta cells and glucagon alpha. I don't know, there's A, right, in glucagon maybe that helps. So uh, alpha from the pancreas, that's the Greek letter for alpha. So it creates glucagon and beta. You just put that little tail on the B. That's where uh, the insulin is coming from. So let's go back to the PowerPoint here so you guys can see this. So now, I think this was a slide we left off on. You'll see when blood glucose levels rise, when's blood glucose levels going to rise? Around a meal time or like an hour after a meal? I'm saying like an hour after, not like right after. Like hours. How about that? hours after a meal or right around a meal? Right around a meal time. So right around a meal time, like right after you eat a meal, blood glucose is going to go up. And you're eating sugar. That's what you say. I, I can't concentrate. I need sugar. So you eat your meal, your blood glucose levels are going to rise, and what cells are going to be stimulated then from the pancreas? Yeah, the beta cells. So I skipped a step if you didn't see that. Is Normally I ask you what hormone, then I ask you where is that hormone coming from, but I could ask a question I would say, you're going to eat a meal, and as soon as you, right after you eat a meal, which cell is going to be stimulated? And that would be what? The beta cells, because they're going to release insulin to do what the blood glucose levels are decreasing. If you're not seeing that, just ask me and I'll try to explain it in a different way. But then it says when levels decline, so typically an hour after a meal, but obviously long after, it's going to stimulate glucagon, glucagon coming from the alpha cells right there. And I would reword the part after the comma. I would say glycogen is going to break down and, and release glucose in the liver. Something like that. I mean, it's all there. I'm just trying to put it into steps for you so you kind of understand it. So the pancreas, there's blood vessels going to the pancreas. The pancreas is like the sensor. It will sense that blood glucose levels are low, and then it's going to secrete glucagon, and glucagon is going to go uh, to the liver, to the brain, and throughout the entire body pretty much. It's going to break down glycogen. Glycogen is a what? Saccharide again? polysaccharides, so it's going to break down the pieces and increase uh, the glucose level. I'll show you a little uh, YouTube clip of it that's up there. Uh, you can read through this if you want. Maybe it's helpful. Just left it in there. So if you go and just write uh, insulin. And it's the third video down. It says the role of insulin in the human body. It's very short. It's pretty good. Pause for a second here. Insulin is a peptide hormone. Out of the three classes, it's a peptide hormone. What type of receptor is it going to have? In terms of intra extra, it's going to have an extracellular receptor because it's what's soluble. Insulin is 
So you'll see that here in a second. So there's the extracellular receptor. And then what's this little thing that came down from there? That's a second messenger. Yeah, it's going to be camp. It's like look AMP. So they show us this little spark of magic. And then we go into the nucleus. Not that the camp is going in there. Other things are. But anyways, the nucleus, we're going to take DNA. And what do we make off of DNA? RNA, off RNA, what do we make? Proteins. And here's a protein channel that we're making. This is a glucose protein channel that's going to the surface that's going to help to bring or uptake glucose into the cell. Because if you look at your drawing that we made, we said insulin is going to cause the uptake of glucose, could add glucose, but the uptake of glucose into the cells. So you need it because you're not going to have a channel for glucose on there until insulin is there. Because as you see here, insulin binds. We had camp go in. We had a series of reactions they didn't show. And we made a protein. In this case, it's a protein channel. And you'll see the purpose now of that. And that's pretty much uh, the end of it. Energy. What's energy? ATP. So just a little uh, few words here. So you've seen, okay, we make DNA, we make RNA, we make proteins. But what are example of proteins? We can make protein channels. And the protein channels, what are they bringing into the cell? Glucose. So are they going to increase or decrease blood glucose levels? They're going to decrease because here would represent the blood. So if we're leaving the blood, we're coming in. We're decreasing that level. So thereby, insulin, which is bound on what type of receptor? Extracellular tends to decrease blood glucose levels. If you want to know a little bit more of information there, there this type of channel is called a GLUT4 uh, receptor. GLUT, G-L-U for glucose, and T, what do you think T is standing for? What are these things? We're doing what the glucose are transport. So there's GLUT receptor, G-L-U-T. This is a GLUT4. So glucose has to enter cells. And these three tissue types, the adipose tissue, the skeletal tissue, and what's the third tissue? The skeletal will be the muscle, the liver, right? Those three tissue types have GLUT4 receptors which need insulin. Other tissues, like such as your brain or your kidneys, they can have uh, glucose go through those cells without the use of insulin. But these need insulin. They call them insulin-dependent transporters. So these are coming to the surface here. Uh, this will be important. I'll talk about diabetes in a second. So glucose is going to be coming in through there through a type of GLUT4 receptor, if you want to read more about it. So anyways, uh, I think that was it. Glucose, energy, and then, yeah, just use energy to jump in. So uh, that's basically that part there. Now, uh, actually, diabetes, if you're interested here, because everybody always asks. Insulin, diabetes, I'll show you a clip. Before I tell you about that, any questions on insulin and glucagon? All right, so diabetics, there's two types, and then there's subtypes. There's diabetes mellitus, and there's diabetes, what's another one? Insipidus. Diabetes mellitus is actual diabetes. Mellitus and insipidus both mean something in Greek. Mellitus means honey something. Honey is what? Sweet. It means honey sweet. The urine is honey sweet because they have high uh, glucose. Before I tell you how it happens, does anybody know where that name came about? Why, like how doctors or nurses or whoever used to test for diabetics? Yeah, it's the best part. I always tell everybody, bottoms up, right? Let's go, taste it, taste honey sweet, person's diabetic. They have high blood glucose because diabetes mellitus has two types. It has type 1 and it has type 2. Type 1 is an autoimmune disease, which means you're attacking your own body. What cells do you think are being destroyed in diabetes mellitus type 1? You know these cells now. Very good, because what do betas produce? Insulin. So the body's attacking and killing those cells. So you can't produce insulin. So that's why diabetes mellitus type 1 patients can take insulin injections. It will be beneficial for them. 
diabetes mellitus type 2, insulin is really not going to help out as much. We call this a type of di uh, insulin insensitivity. What's going on with that, and I actually should have left that video back up here, is when insulin binds to its receptor, again, what type of receptor? It binds to its extracellular receptors, it produces what type of receptors on the surface here? You don't have to be that specific, but just general. I heard glute T, right? Glu glucose channels. So or glute 4 if you want to be very specific. But it produces glucose channels. So with diabetes mellitus type 2, they produce insulin normally. But the insulin doesn't work as effectively. Why? Is because right, you know, if somebody starts eating after a meal, what's going to be secreted? Right, right after a meal, insulin. So insulin will be secreted. And here we get the channels. And these channels are active to do what to blood glucose levels? To decrease because we're going to uptake, we're going to uptake them, they're going to come in. That's what uptake means, into the cells. Again, it doesn't disappear, it goes somewhere. So it's coming into here. With the type 2, somebody's keep, they keep eating and eating and eating and there's build up of sugar. And then these channels are saying, all right, I'm here, I'm working for you, I'm trying to bring all the sugar in here, I'm getting packed inside here, there's really no room. And even though I'm here and I'm being stimulated, the levels are still being sensed as high. So what happens to these channels is they stop working. And then some of them degrade and then come back into the cell. So that insulin uh, wouldn't work out. So that's diabetes mellitus type 2. That's 95% of diabetes uh, in the U.S. It might be worldwide. I know worldwide's lower. The U.S. is the highest. But anyways, because we enjoy our food, and I guess I'm not helping with that myself. But anyways, um, with diabetes mellitus type 2, insulin doesn't help out as much as it would in type 1. So that's why they say, you know, you got to exercise, and when you get that back under control, then it will... Uh, it will start to be more sensitive, those insulin-sensitive uh, glucose transporters. So that's the difference with those two types. So just let me show you a quick clip on that. That was coming up next. But it, but it can be under control once the weight gets back under control. The pancreas, located behind the stomach, is involved in the body's ability to use glucose. Within the pancreas, tiny structures called islets of Langerhans secrete hormones into the blood. These islets are composed of several cell types. One cell type, beta cells, release insulin after every meal. Insulin, along with glucose, passes into the bloodstream and travels throughout the entire body. Insulin binds to specific receptors located on cells. The binding prompts the opening of glucose gates, allowing glucose to enter the cell. Diabetes is a disease in which the body has trouble using glucose. In type 1 diabetes, the beta cells are no longer able to produce insulin. In type 2 diabetes, insulin is produced and binds with the cell's receptors. However, when insulin binds with the receptor, the glucose gates fail to open, preventing the entry of glucose into the cell. And then sometimes they degrade and go back into the cell. So that's diabetes mellitus. Diabetes insipidus is actually really not diabetes. Uh, well, how does that come about? Is diabetics, there's so much sugar in the urine. And through osmosis, which way is water going to go? Towards higher or lower concentration? Higher. So if there's sugar in the urine, water is going to leave our body and go to the urine. So are you going to be more or less thirsty if you're urinating more? more thirsty. So diabetics are thirsty. Diabetes insipidus, so you see where it got the word diabetes, even though it's not diabetes. Uh, insipidus means thirst, means you're thirsty. Uh, there's a hormone in the brain coming out of the posterior pituitary that regulates water from the kidneys. You have two choices if you remember the posterior pituitary hormones. Which one is that? There are two hormones coming out of the posterior pituitary. One of them yeah, one of them regulates water from the kidneys. Vasopressin, also known as what? ADH. So to put this together here, ADH, anti what? Diuretic. So anti-diuretic is going to cause you to urinate more or less. Anti-diuretic. Diuretic means urinate. Anti-diuretic means less. 
urination. So if ADH is working, you're going to urinate less. But this diabetes insipidus is actually a problem in the pituitary gland where ADH is not being secreted. So if ADH is not being secreted, are you going to urinate more or less? More, which means you're going to be more or less thirsty. More thirsty. So that's a part of why it's called diabetes insipidus because they have symptoms similar to actual diabetic patients that they have that thirst. So that's just the difference between those two. Any questions with diabetes? I know it took some time on it, but usually people ask about it, so I just to talk about it. Okay, so uh, insulin, there's really not too much new here. I'm just putting things into words that I drew up for you on the diagram. It's going to accelerate glucose uptake, so if we're uptaking it, maybe you want to add where do we uptake it into? Into the cells, how many different cell types? Three, and you have them listed for you on your sheet. And uh, also, if it's going to be taking it up, what do we make when we store glucose? What's that called, the storage thing? Glycogen is a storage compound. Is that a mono or a polysaccharide? It's a polysaccharide. So you see, if you watch this video, you got like at least 25, if not more, of the questions. So glucagon, released by alpha cells, they're going to break down glycogen. What's bigger, glycogen or glucose? Glycogen, because it's the storage thing. It's like if you had boxes, each box would be glucose. When you want to store the boxes, you put them somewhere, such as the liver or adipose or whatever, and you tie these boxes up. That's glycogen. And then when you need them, you break up the tape in between them, and you release them to where you need them. So, uh, yeah, glucagon is going to break down the glycogen, thereby increasing or decreasing blood glucose levels. We're going to be increasing them. And then that's it there for the pancreas. The only thing left is the pineal gland, which is very short. Any questions? Okay, so let's go we can flip to the back side of your packet, just three slides. The last three slides of the packet, the pineal gland. The pineal gland, I should have put a picture in there, but I didn't. Okay, so the last three slides of your endocrine packet. It should be the second to last one here. It says, lies in the posterior portion of roof of third ventricle. Now, before you jump on that word ventricle, there's two areas where there are ventricles. What area is this talking about? It's talking about the brain, because how many ventricles in the brain? There's four ventricles. If you were thinking ventricle, you're obviously thinking about what else as well. The heart, but that you don't call them, you call them right and left ventricle. So here it's around the third ventricle, like around the thalamus. It's actually posterior to the thalamus. I'm sorry I didn't put a picture up there, but you guys can look it up and you'll see where it is. So uh, the cells of there, what word up there means cells? Sites. The pinealocytes. The pinealocytes secrete melatonin. Again, I'm trying to help you out here, not to be confused with melanin. Melanin does what? Yeah, it gives you color, uh, skin pigmentation. So make a darker skin color. So how do I remember that? Well, in the brain we have melatonin, and we have another hormone that sounds similar to it, serotonin. I mean, they come from different parts of the body as well too, but they sound the same. Melatonin, serotonin, so those are gonna both be the brain ones. Melanin sounds different. That's gonna be your skin pigment. So pineocytes will make melatonin, you guys should be able to fill this blank in here. Yeah, the sleep-wake cycle. Specifically, melatonin does which one of those two, sleep or wake? Sleep. I haven't used it personally myself. I did ask other people. They said it didn't work that well. Anybody try any melatonin? Did it work? Or did it work for you? You guys, did it work? I don't know. I guess the other class didn't work for us, so... Like everybody last class, like, oh, it doesn't work. You guys say, crazy dreams? How crazy? Yeah, we don't have to get into one of that. That's just an answer. But anyways, uh, I'll, I'll explain that. Uh, I'm going to cut that out of the video. Though. But anyways, so, um, yeah, so circadian rhythms, that's the word for sleep-wake cycle. And I just posted up a picture, you know, you can have them, I guess, Rite Aid has them and all that stuff. 
any questions with endocrine system? So let me show you what I did with digestive. So digestive system, I didn't finish that packet. I told you only have one more packet, and by that I meant pretty much one more unit, but I just didn't finish the digestive. Because what I'm trying to do is instead of giving you the 237 slides from the publisher, which you'll be sitting through your test, flip, 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 I decided I was going to cut those down for you. So <clears throat> today we're just going to do like digestive, just up in the mouth and in the head, the oral cavity. So I took the first, I believe, uh, 83 slides or so. Yeah, 83 oral cavity, and then after that, pharynx. So I took the first 83 slides from the publisher, broke them down to 16 slides, and honestly, it's what I teach at Upstate, it's just these 16 slides on that part. So even if you go on, they're still gonna ask you just this stuff. The rest is more uh, like biochemistry and stuff like that. So we'll go through that portion here. Just a reminder on your uh, dates, next week is the last quiz on um, Tuesday for you guys. This one is Monday. Also along in that same week is the practical, digestive and reproductive. And I guess tonight's lab is anyone who doesn't know that there's no more handouts. It's just the handouts that you had last week and the week before. And then exam four is going to be uh, after that, the week after. So uh, 14th and 15th, same time, same place. I don't know if you guys looked on, I think it was uh, the website for OCC. It's kind of a little bit messed up, so I'm in the process of fixing that. But same time, same place, just come here and we'll be all taken care of shortly. And endocrine, digestive, and if there's reproductive, it's honestly going to be like five or six slides. I just want to tell you about FSH and LH, because I just forgot to throw them in the other packet. So it really won't be too much. So any question on dates? So chapter 24. So here, yes, I did write some things. I did copy and paste some things, but I didn't really get to highlight things in different colors. So I'm just going to tell you, you know, this is important. Make sure you get this idea about it. When we study the digestive tract, the way to organize it, to, to organize it, sorry, I'm just getting really tired here, is two different portions. There's your digestive tract, and then there's your accessory organs. So it's like one half, and then this is the other half. The digestive tract, when you're born, or even before you're born, I'm sorry, when you just fuse together ovary and sperm, and you're starting out from just a couple cells as an embryo, your digestive tract is just a tube, inside and then everything on the outside. It's just one straight tube. But as you start to develop, the tube takes twists and turns, becomes your intestines, widens, becomes your stomach. But it's still the same tube. That's your digestive tract. It has two other names as well, too, that you can highlight if you want to put in red, if you do those colors. It's your GI tract, your gastrointestinal, and a third name for that, what do you think I'm going to say? Elementary canal. So there's three names for that whole tube, from in to out. And then this is more specific detail of all that stuff. Large intestine, then you have rectum, and then anus would be the last portion coming out. So that's the tube. Now, the accessory organs, as you see here, are going to be your teeth. Things that are accessories coming off. You know, accessories, you wear them that are extra. Um, tongue, your salivary glands, which we talked about, your liver. And then you guys are going to fill in that one that goes along with this one here. Your gallbladder and your pancreas. So these are accessory things coming off of that too that help in the digestive process. Just pictures. I'm going to skip through these. You're going to see six functions of the digestive system here. Every book I see, they kind of organize them a little bit differently. I'll highlight the main important ones. Ingestion is when you're going to eat food. So that one's pretty self-explanatory. You're going to ingest. The two here, spend a little bit more time. Mechanical and chemical digestion. Now, don't say the answer out right away because you got to think about it for a second. When food enters into the mouth, is that going to be broken down mechanically or chemically? Both. How is it being broke down mechanically? Teeth and your tongue. How is it being broke down chemically? There's one word in there. Saliva, what's in saliva? There's a word down here. Enzymes in there. 
So it's going to be broken down both ways. So that's something, you know, you can jot down that when food's in the mouth, it's getting broken down mechanically and chemically. We're still going to be talking more about that. So crushing and sharing, obviously the teeth, the tongue as well too. And there's another process here that does mechanical digestion, which I'm going to start talking a little bit more about after a few slides. But this is an important term here, segmentation. Now, I didn't have time to really organize this, but there's a word for the movement of food as it goes down. You probably know this. Yeah, peristalsis. You're going to see that two slides from now. But peristalsis is the movement of food. So segmentation is movement. It's movement two ways, but it's going to break down food as well as movement. I'll show you a clip on that. So just hold on to that for a second. Chemical processing, the important idea is by what again? Enzymes. For example, we're going to talk about these more next time. A little bit today. I'll mention them now so you can hear them. There is an enzyme called a peptidase. What part of that means enzyme? Ace. A peptidase, is, it's in the name, what is it breaking? Peptides, which are proteins. Lipases are going to break down lipids. So the last thing, amylases, what's that going to break down? Bigger glycogen, we call these things, not lipids, not proteins, but just different. You're on there, you're talking about the smaller units right now. They're getting there. Bigger, what, do you, what type of food is it? Say, eat this, eat this, eat that. Balance how much of this you eat. You talk about proteins, you talk about lipids, you talk about, I think I heard it, carbs. So they break down carbohydrates. Glycogen, you weren't wrong. Glycogen is like the smaller carbohydrate, which will break it down into glucose. So remember that word amylase, because you're going to see that today. I'm going to ask you again. So this slide you don't have. Uh, there's some animations on there that are very helpful. I'm going to show you now. So if you want, you can write down this site, nutrition.jpspub.com, uh, or just jppub. I'm just thinking about having a drink. That's why I said that. So anyways, uh, if you go to that website here, I will, something else I'm going to have to cut out of that video. If you go to it here and paste it in, it's working. It's not really not crunching down here. It's really helpful too. Right, let me see if we have peristalsis in here. But you can write down, by the way, to see if this is going to work or not. Once you go to that website, on the left hand side, it's going to say Science Animations. Click on Science Animations, and you can watch those videos because I don't see it working out right now. Yeah, I don't see any decent YouTube videos. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'll use that here in a second. But anyways, yeah, this website doesn't want to work. Yeah, so just click on science animations will be on the left-hand side when we get to it. I will just use other stuff, I guess, for right now. So here's three more functions. Propulsion. Propulsion, an important term in there if you want to highlight that one in red, is what? Peristalsis. Peristalsis is a one-way movement of food. A one-way movement. What's the food tube called? Esophagus. The one-way movement of food down the esophagus is called peristalsis. So this is where I want to show you guys the clips. Here's peristalsis. You're seeing the food move down by muscular contractions. It's just pushing it. So it continues and goes down to the stomach. So that's peristalsis. And there's a word there you should also know. A bolus. A bolus is a ball of food when it's in your mouth. And the food's mixed with what? What's the fluid called? Saliva. When food is mixed with saliva, some of you want to wake up and see you writing this. When food is mixed with saliva, we call that a bolus. So it's a bolus in the mouth, and then it's a bolus, what's the tube going down called? The esophagus. So it's a bolus in the mouth, and it's a bolus in the esophagus. Why am I saying this? Because it's going to change names once it gets down to the stomach. 
when it gets down to the stomach, the stomach is what type of environment, what type of pH? It's acidic. So when it mix, mixes with that acidic environment, it changes name to this. It's pronounced like a K, kind. The bolus is now called kind. That food is mixed with acidic secretions, which we'll talk about next time, and it's called kind. From the stomach, it's going to move into the first part. What's the first part of the small intestine? Either one of those pronunciation, pronunciations, duodenum or duodenum. So it's going to move into that part. Now it's not called, what's the word for the one-way movement of food? Peristalsis. It's not called peristalsis. Now it's called, this one back here, segmentation. What do you think is going to happen to that food by, by the name of this here? Segment. It's going to break down into pieces. So that's the clip I was trying to show you. I guess it's still not working. Let me see if YouTube has something on that here. But it's called segmentation. It's a pretty general word. I don't know it's going to come up. But, uh, yeah, I don't see it here. But anyways, it's on that site. It's really good. When you click science animations, it'll be the first thing that pops up. But basically, food's not just moving one way. It's moving two ways. It's going back and forth through the intestines. It's kind of like if you're going to mix something up. You're mixing it. And then the intestines are going to squeeze at different areas. For example, if you were at uh, any game, like the SU game, everybody, they get up and they do the what? They stand up. The wave. That's just going around. Would that be an example of peristalsis or uh, segmentation? It's going around. It's going around one way. That's just peristalsis. It continues. It just keeps going around. Segmentation. We'd have, we'd have to do what with that wave? You'd have to start at more than one point. So maybe like, I don't know, section 200 or something, section 100 or something. Like you'd have two waves started so that it breaks things down. So basically peristalsis is going like this, this one after the other. Segmentation is going like this, like this, like this, like this. So it's chopping it down. It's pushing it back and forth. So it breaks it. Thereby doing what to the surface area of the food? It increases it. So if it increases the surface area, there's more or less room for enzymes to mix with that food. There's more room. So that's what's happening here in the intestines. Specifically the small intestines more than the large. But it's happening in the intestines. So what do you want to know about this here? There is a word meaning movement, and that's under number four. Propulsion is movement. And then there's two ways to break down things. Mechanically, or what? <laughs> Chemically. Peristalsis falls under propulsion. Again, propulsion meaning what? Movement. Segmentation also fa falls under propulsion. Because it's still moving food. It's not just moving it one way, though. It's moving it two ways. Ultimately one way, ultimately one way. But it's kind of swishing back and forth as it makes its way down. So it falls under propulsion and it falls under what? Because it's getting broken up. Mechanical digestion. So mechanical digestion is not just your teeth, it's anything that's going to mechanically break things. It's chemical if it uses what? If it uses enzymes. So that, that's not product, product segmentation. A lot of people confuse these two. So, True or false, segmentation and peristalsis are both, both propulsion. True. True or false, uh, segmentation happens in the esophagus. False. What happens in the esophagus? Peristalsis. What do we call that food that's in there mixed with saliva? Bolus. When it gets to the stomach, what do we call it? Chyme. And what's the type of movement, that type of propulsion through the intestines called? Segmentation. But it's not just movement, it's also what? It's not just propulsion, it's mechanical processing. So segmentation is two things. Peristalsis is one thing. They both share movement, whether it's esophagus or intestines, but which one has an extra feature to it? Segmentation. It's breaking while it's moving because it's swishing the food back and forth. So again, I spent some time with that because that's one that's commonly missed as well too.
and then absorption, which we'll talk about more later, and, and defecation uh, of food or excretion. So if we just look at this picture, and I'm just flashing back and forth, <coughs> is this propulsion or mechanical uh, digestion right here? It's just moving it. Nothing's breaking down. Propulsion, right? The food just moves. So that would just be propulsion. If it broke into pieces, it would be called segmentation. So again, uh, go watch that clip on that. It will explain it to you very nicely, very short as well, too. How are we doing time? How are we doing right? So this is the last thing here with the oral cavity. In the oral cavity, we have three pairs of glands. Three pairs. So how many glands total? Six. Six. We have three on one side on the left, and we have three on the other side. We have the parotid gland, which is right around the ear. We have the submandibular. What does submandibular mean? Below the mandible, below the gyro as well too. And then sublingual, meaning what? Under the tongue. Which one of those looks like, I'm gonna ask like a step two question here. Which one looks like it produces the most saliva? Parotid, yeah, this is like a look and take your first reaction here. Parotid, why? Yeah, it's bigger. So the parotid gland is the largest gland, so it produces the most saliva. There's a lot of things you could mention about saliva. One of them that I didn't put up there that I guess I could have, I don't want to test you on it, but it's 99% what? So water. Saliva is 99% water. It's 1% other stuff, which is like five, six, seven other things, like ions, different salts, potassium, sodium, and enzymes, most importantly. So here we go. I told you I was going to ask you this later. What was I going to ask you on the note? Amylase breaks down what? Breaks down what? So. Good. Carbohydrates. I know you definitely remember because you kept guessing what we got. Right? So, carbohydrates. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates. How many glands? And I'll give you a moment to read that slide. Secrete amylase. Let's give everybody a moment. There's two. The parotid and which other one? I don't want to just give you the answers even though it's written up there. I want you to read it for yourself so you see it and you highlight it. So the parotid and the submandibular, those both produce salivary amylase, so those are both going to break down carbs. So if somebody was going to ask you, just anybody who hasn't really taken A&P, and you're going to talk to them and they're going to say, well, where are carbs broken down? Where are lipids broken down? Where are proteins broken down? If they ask you, where are proteins, I'm not sorry, where are carbs first broken down, what would you tell them? In your mouth. Because of? Because of amylase, specifically salivary amylase, because the pancreas is going to make its own, which we'll get to, which is simply going to be called pancreatic amylase. So carbs are first broken down in the mouth. That's something you should jot down as well, too. And as well, mucans and buffers, which will help to control the pH as it's going down the esophagus so it doesn't mess up the environment of the esophagus. For example, if you eat something very spicy, There'll be some mucus secreted, some things to kind of buffer that as it's making its way down to the stomach. And all glands are going to secrete that as well, too. Again, parotid and submandibular, those are both going to secrete salivary hormones. And then the last thing is to talk about the tongue a little bit. The tongue is doing mechanical digestion, and it's also doing chemical digestion. Give you a second to figure out why chemical digestion. You just say it when you figure it out. Mm -hmm. Lipase. What's lipase breaking down? Lipids. Again, it's in the name. Enzyme and an ace. Not all of them, but most of them. And an ace. And they, uh, they're named after what they work on. So lipase works on lipids. So what can you tell somebody about what's broken down first in your mouth? Carbohydrates and lipids, not proteins. If you take a guess on this, you might get it. Where are proteins first broken down? Before then. It's good, but before then. The one we part of the intestines, the stomach. So proteins will first be broken down in your stomach. We'll talk about that next time when we talk about pepsinogen or pepsin, which is pretty much the same thing, just whether it's active or inactive. But we'll talk about that next.
But anyway, so uh, lipids and what again? Carbs are first broken down in your mouth. Lingual lipase, lingual referring to tongue. So it's produced, the tongue produces lipase, which is going to break it down. There's also lipase coming from your pancreas, similar to what I said about amylase. What do you think that's going to be called? Pancreatic lipase as well. So it's pretty simple the names they put together for these here. Now, the other thing to say is uh, two more things in a sense. Uh, your tongue's going to do sensation because there's nerves going there. You have your cranial nerves, such as your hypoglossal, glossopharyngeal. So there's going to be sensation. You can sense temperature, you can sense taste, all those things. But when we get to taste specifically, there are these uh, little areas, little bumps on your tongue that are called papilla. There are four different types of papilla. Hopefully that word rings a little bit of a bell, so like you've heard this before. For example, if you think of a renal, what is the triangle in there? Pyramid, the tip of it is the papilla. Also in the heart, papillary muscle. So papilla is a tip. People always think it means taste buds, but it's not. Some have taste buds, most actually have taste buds, but one does not. And as you can see on there, which one? It's right down, it says except filiform. So you have four different types of papilla. These are the four types. I didn't write it out specifically in the slide, but it's here in the picture. So the one that doesn't have taste buds on it are the filiform papilla. How do I remember that? Is that um, what their job is is to kind of mechanically move the food around. It's very small moving the food around, little type, type fingers in a sense. So they're like kind of feeling. So that's just how I remember it. That's not where the name came from. But filiform don't have taste buds. So all the other papilla, or all these bumps that you see on the tongue, they all have taste buds, except which one? Except for the filiform. Any questions with today's stuff? Okay, we'll continue that next time.